Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's go ahead and begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we again so thankful that we have the privilege to study, <coughs> worship, share together. We ask that your Holy Spirit will join us and lighten our minds. May we draw closer to you and may we fulfill your purpose for our lives at this time in history. We pray in your holy name. Amen. So, uh, good morning. I'm looking forward to next week. I'll be back in person next week for our, our second Sabbath of every month, potluck in class. So hopefully I'll be able to visit with you all in person next week, move around the tables, time to share. Looking forward to it. Our class today is entitled Mission to the Unreached Part 2, which is Lesson 11 in the quarterly God's Mission, My Mission. And the first paragraph in the lesson reads, from the beginning, a loving God sought his children. And to our day, the same loving God is still seeking to reach the lost, including the lost in the cities. In 2018, the United Nations published its latest findings, which say that 55% of the planet's population lives in urban areas. And this will grow if time should last to 68% by 2050. We have no choice. We must witness to those in the cities. Has anyone there done ministry or mission in the cities? No? no. no? Yes. Any thoughts about what that entails, ministry in the cities? What might it look like? Helping the sick, for one thing, and being kind. Well, so, you know, that's what I thought, too. The ministries that in the cities that I'm most familiar with are almost always for the most vulnerable populations, which represent a very small percentage of the population that's actually in the cities. Such things as homeless shelters, food kitchens, battered women's shelters, Goodwill, Toys for Tots, free medical clinics and care and so forth. If you think about most of the ministries that I'm familiar with that operate in the cities, it really seems to be targeting that slice of society that struggles at the lowest poverty levels uh, rather than, and that's a small percentage of the total population of a city. That's because the And these are very worthy ministries, very worthy ministries. But how do we reach those not in that slice with, that don't need those services? Well, that's because the rich have need of nothing. They think they have it all. They don't. Right, so that's the question. How do we reach those that don't need those services? Well, Tim, everybody needs food. So I was part of the country life back many years ago, and we would have people from all walks of life come in and uh, check us out. We would, you know, people that couldn't afford the foods, we would, you know, give them free food where they could eat, and uh, then we would. Uh, you know, visit with them, get to know them, they would come back, and then we would give Bible studies later on if they were interested. So, so the, the, those who don't need free food, how would they benefit from a service like that? The friendship. Yeah, just befriended them. But, but why, why would, my, my point is, why would they come to your facility? Is it a grocery store? They might I mean, those those people. those with yeah, funds, yeah. the the wealthy, they they go out shopping, or they sell, send their maid or their cook or their chef to do the shopping for them. Mm. So I, I I love what you're suggesting. I'm just wondering, how do we reach the people who don't need the assistance? Um, Tim, uh, I, we used to live in Hagerstown, Maryland, and there was this there was a big project there on on the north side of town, and and there was a um, what do you call it? A thrift store there in the area, and so. But uh, Rachel would love to go to this thrift store because there were there was a uh, clothes there that she liked, and, and um, she commented one time to to the clerk said, "Oh, you're in such a wonderful location, right by the projects, and I bet you they appreciate it." And the clerk says, "Oh no, none of those people come here." So you'd be surprised how many people will go to different places, and so. Okay, so what you're suggesting is then opening some type of a business. Well, this is what a, a facility that does business with the public. This is what Greg was just saying. He says he, he yeah. was with Country Life, 
and that it, it was a co-op type of a store. They had all types of products there, some exotic products there, and and they attracted all types of people would come in there. So that was right. his point. Okay, so yeah. so thank you for that because I, I didn't know what Country Life was. Yeah. That's a name of a store that people could then visit and shopping. That's why I asked, is it like a grocery store or something like that? It's like a mission project. You know, it's a mission project and it's a store and they oftentimes have restaurants with them. Yeah, we have both. And, um, and, they, and they have, you know, interesting food and stuff there. So, lots so of the idea food. that we, we create something that the, the people in the cities would have interest in procuring or participating or, or benefiting from in some way so that they have an interest in and they come and frequent the facility and we have opportunity. That would be the idea. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a, so, so food, making some type of restaurant or health, health, healthy food venue or, or I, I think I've known other people who've made like these healthy food vendor trucks and things and have moved around different parts of the city and sold healthy food and have some literature there when they're doing it. Okay. Witness Good idea. Witnessing where you work. Pardon? Pardon? There's wild Witnessing where you work. Yeah. Where you work. Where you work. Yeah. So getting a job in the city. And then yeah. there's Wildwood here and just local, you know, and that attracts a lot of different people, you know. You're familiar with them, I'm sure. Wildwood? They have sure, to, sure. Yeah. yeah, people leave the city to go out to Wildwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so again, because they have a need particularly, going to Wildwood is you have a health problem, you're looking for some holistic benefit. So you've created a, a service that could speak to the need, regardless of whether they're wealthy or not. If you have a health problem, wealthy people get health problems. And, and then there's a resource that might benefit you to get healthier. So again, creating resources that could be beneficial that people would pursue. Going to walk have you seen street preachers standing on the street shouting about the end of days? Do you think that would be effective? I don't know. No. So. No, it's not. Have you seen people standing on the streets or subway stations handing out literature to whoever walks by? Yes. Do you think that would be effective? No. no. What about door-to-door -door canvassing in the cities with literature evangelists selling our, our literature? Yes, sometimes. That works. That used ways. to be good. Yes. Yeah. The call porters? Is there a hand up? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Stan? I have a friend who has always enjoyed working with cars that has become a hobby. He's joined several different car clubs. He rubs shoulders with some of the richest men in the area. Uh, and as he's gotten involved, he has been asked to fulfill several different positions in the organizations. And as such, people have been asking, well, why don't you do this on Saturday? Or why why do you believe the way you do uh, that is one way hobbies that attract a different population than than the uh, very poorest of people no I, I love that idea just networking in networks that wouldn't necessarily rub shoulders with uh, having some common points of interest and then letting your light so shine before men that they Give glory to your Father in heaven, as Jesus said in Matthew 5. I really like that. Uh, what about TV, radio, internet, social media programs that contain the truth? Broadcast into those places. Yeah, absolutely, yes. How about moving into the city and becoming part of the neighborhood? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can work here, but don't want to live there. Tim? Don't want to live there. Tim, what about these big, big mega health clinics that they've had like out in Phoenix and they had one in Arlington, <coughs> Fort Worth? You, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I about. think, I think, you know, as, as, as an Adventist organization, the Adventist organization has clearly taken the position of ministry evangelism through the health care industry uh, and creating you know, hospitals and clinics and training much of our people to be healthcare workers. And even if you're not working in an Adventist system, 
you're working in healthcare and other places. I think this has been a clear avenue of evangelism historically. Yes? These health clinics are still ministering to the, the people like you described at first, you yeah, know, a certain sure. slice of the population. Yes, mother. I belong to sev several organizations that are not uh, Adventist, and I have taken literature that I have gotten here. I've also done it in several doctor's offices, and I have handed it out, and I've had some people say, do you have another one? I want one too. So I... And, and so you notice the common route to all of these is we have to connect with people, whether it's having some type of a co-op, you know, community facing service that we provide, healthcare, food resources, whether it's um, hobbies, whether it's involved in um, various community network, we have to actually somehow come in contact with people. Yeah, find out what yeah. find out what their felt need is, and then meet that need. Well, before I retired, Sunday's lesson. Before Pardon? I retired, before I retired in nursing, I found the best way to witness to people is through food, because I would bring things, vegetarian stuff, and, that, and that, how did you make that? That's delicious. No meat. I said, no, there's no meat in it. You know, and doctors, nurses, everybody responded to that. Nice. That's very nice. Yeah. So Sunday's lesson asks us to read Judges three one through six, and this is what it says. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebak Hemoth, uh, they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their forefathers through Moses. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their, their sons and served their gods. How do you understand these verses? What do they mean? He left them there to test the Israelites. Well, and part, I didn't like to teach them warfare. No. Yeah, he left them there to test them and teach them warfare. What do you, what do you make of this? I don't think that's <laughs> Pardon? Of their character. What, what's the first question we need to ask? Law lens. What law lens? Right? What, law level? what law lens? That's right. The over the law lens is first, and then the overall context of scripture, the grand theme of what the scripture story and the focus and what 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 the purpose of God is in having the scriptures written, and why God inspired certain stories to be retained in the scriptures, and there are many lives that we never even heard about that lived in proximation, very individual lives that we have no inspired record of. So why, what's the design law? What is the context of happening in the story? What is the purpose in God in recording this? When the Lord puts someone to the test, what is he testing? The character? The faith? This, it, it, and your answer will always go back to what law lens you're using. Loyalty. If you use the imposed law lens, have you ever heard of the tests of God through the imposed law lens? It's very, very frightening about how well you behave. Yes. <laughs> but if you understand design law, the test is always the same. The test is, will they trust God? That's what it is. It's always a test of will you choose to exercise trust, faith, confidence in God or not? That's what all the tests of scripture are. And when they, when they do, then their faith, their confidence, their trust grows beyond the belief that devils have and tremble 
to a faith that is living and results in loyalty to God. You see, we cannot grow in faith, in trust, unless we are placed in positions where we are required to exercise our faith, where our faith is tried or tested and we choose to say no to the fear, the insecurity, the doubts, the temptations. We say no to the temptation to act to save self and instead choose to live out the truth and trust God with how it turns out. This is the issue on all the tests. It's always been the issue. Are we faithful, loyal friends of God who actually trust him? Not people who believe in him, but distrust him and need all these mechanisms in place to protect us from him and apply the devil's ways to the way we treat others while we claim faith in him. As you see happening through scripture over and over and again, these people who crucified Jesus claimed belief in the God of heaven while they used the devil's methods because they actually didn't trust the God of heaven. There's a difference between claiming a belief in God, the devil's belief in tremble, and actually trusting him with how we live. And Jesus asked this very question about where we live today in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes again, will he find people who actually trust him, who are faithful to him, who have chosen to trust him with their lives, futures, fortunes, and families, or will he only find people who claim to believe in him, but who have put their trust in the rules, the rituals, the ceremonies, the blood payments, the wealth, their wealth, the various institutions, or the power that they can wield over others to make themselves feel safe? Where do they actually trust? Paul said in Romans 14, 23, Whatever does not come from faith is sin. The Greek word for faith is the same word as trust. If we're not acting out of trust, then we're acting out of fear and selfishness. That's sin. God wants us to return to live to a living confidence, trust, faith in him. And he allows events to come upon us that will test our faith, to put us in positions where we have to decide. Do we scheme? Calculate, plot, plan, connive, manipulate, bend the rules, make excuses, cheat in order to save self? Or do we stand for what we know is right and trust God with how it turns out? David, when he was dedicating materials and his son for the building of the temple, prayed the following in First Chronicles 29, 17, and 18. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen the joy, with, seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. O oh Lord, God of our Father, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of the, your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. This is what the test is always about. It is a test of where our loyalty, our confidence, our faith will be. So at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve had a test. Would they trust God or would they distrust God? That was the test. Abraham, when he was told to sacrifice Isaac, notice what it says in Genesis 22, 1 and 2. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Why does God, why does God test like this? Is it to trip people up? Is it to trap them? Is it to get them to fail, to fall? Is it to get them to do some behavior? You can get a legal record, a violation, 35 in a 30 zone. I tested your foot on the gas pedal. You were, you were going over. Sometimes, no. Go ahead, Tina. Sometimes the Lord tests people like Job for the universe to see that he does have faithful people here. Well, I was going to kind of suggest to you that, that, that Job was not being tested by the Lord. Well, Abraham was being tested because Abraham, if you recall, prior to this, had 
had allowed the fear and the selfishness to take control on more than one occasion when he lied about Sarah being his wife. He didn't trust God to protect. He had to connive. He had to plot. He had to angle. He had to play the angles to protect himself. And so now to free Abraham from self self survival drives that we all are born with to have him fully settled as a man of faith who trusts God with all things. He put him to this opportunity where he would choose to actually trust God with the outcome. And he did. And thus is where Abraham ultimately became the man of faith. Even though he had faith all along, he wasn't yet freed from the temptations of the fear and selfishness intruding and getting him to act outside of faith, out of distrust. And so that's why Abraham, but Job, at the very opening of the story, before any events came, God had already said about Job, he's perfect and righteous in all his ways. There's no one on the earth like him. And so Job was called not to test his faith, but as a witness, as you say, to reveal to others who can't read the hearts and minds. So Job's activities there weren't for his maturing, but for the larger controversy to be a witness for God in this conflict to others. And so that's a, a that's a very good point, but I don't think it was quite the same here that it was for Job's development at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tim, could you not yes. say the commandments are a test for us, or what? I mean, I mean that's how that's how the church certainly portrays them. Yeah, I, I don't. So could the commandments be used as a test, depending on what they are? Yes, ultimately, our decision to live in harmony with God's laws is always a test. Are we trusting him with the outcome? Or are we angling for ourselves? Do we, do we trust him with our finances or do we steal from our neighbor to pay our bills this month? There's a test there. Do we trust him with our reputation and our promotion to the next job, or do we bear false witness about, against the other person who has applied to make sure that we get it and they don't? And so yeah, you can certainly see how all those instructions, which are the principles of love, are constantly in our day-to-day -day life a test. Do we trust God or are we angling for self? But were they given as a test? No, I don't think they were given as a test. I think they were given as a diagnostic instrument, a mirror that we look into to see where we fall short in a protective hedge. But I don't think they were given as a test, but they certainly uh, help us expose those opportunities where we're being tested. So what we see happening when God tests is simply the outworking of his design laws, the law of truth, the law of love, the law of liberty, the law of exertion. If you want something to get stronger, you must exercise it. What God wants, understand what he wants from every one of us. He cannot create and he cannot choose. God wants our love. He cannot create our love toward him by an act of creation. He can create a being who can love, but he can't create them to love. They have to choose to love because love requires freedom. He can create robots who pretend to love, but they're just puppets. What he wants is our love. He wants our loyalty. He wants our trust. He wants our friendship. He wants our devotion. He cannot create them and he cannot choose them for us. And thus he puts us in positions where we have the opportunity to choose to trust God and see his deliverance, see his hand working, which strengthens our confidence, our trust in him, our love for him, our appreciation for him. And we grow in character to be like Christ. God provides everything for our healing. Understand, he provides it all. Everything for our healing, for our salvation, for our deliverance from sin. He provides the truth that destroys lies and wins us to trust. He provides the love that casts out the fear. He provides the Savior, his son, who became a real human being. And as a human being, using only his human abilities, chose to love and trust his father. And in all things... And he received as a human being the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as we do. If you remember, he was empowered. He says, of myself, I can do nothing. And as a human, Jesus developed a perfect, sinless, mature, righteous character, living out God's design laws in all aspects of his life. He destroyed the infection of fear and selfishness and then rose again as the second Adam, the new head of humanity, 
for, for us. He provides the Holy Spirit to bring the truth home to our hearts and minds, to convict us of sin, to convict us of duty, to convict us of the truth. And then he provides us freedom, real freedom to accept and choose the truth or to reject it. When we choose the truth, he provides power for us to succeed. The power doesn't come from us. The truth doesn't come from us. The motive doesn't come from us. The love doesn't come from us. The new drives and desires to live a better life don't come from us. The choice to say yes and to do it comes from us. And then he provides us opportunities to test our faith. Situations that require us to choose. Do we trust God? Do we choose what we know is in harmony with his will, purposes, instructions, guidance, design laws for life, and then trust him with outcomes? Or do we choose to break trust with him and seek to advance ourselves through our own manipulative ways? So what was the test that God wanted the Israelites to face and pass? Well, the lesson asks us to read 1 Kings 11, 1 through 6. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations around which the Lord had told Israel, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully de devoted to the Lord his God as his, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. What was the test that the Israelites were supposed to pass? Was it about killing enemies? They were not supposed to kill, or they were supposed to kill, and they didn't kill them. They were supposed to kill, and they didn't kill them. Was that the test, though? Was that the test they didn't pass? No. Was it about being friendly? They needed to be more friendly and less prejudicial. Was it about marrying people of foreign descent? Was that the test? If you think that was the test, what about Moses marrying Zipporah? It was Ethiopian. Or Salmon marrying Rahab, the prostitute, and together they had a son named Boaz who married Ruth, the Moabitess. And both Rahab and Ruth became part of the genealogy of Jesus. The test was how they, how they had faith in God and revealed his character to the people around him. That was the test. So, so the, the test, was it about marrying non-Israeli women? No. 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 About trusting God. It was, yeah. it was about not being loyal to God. About giving their hearts to other gods. The marrying of other women did not have any, anything to do with genetics, ethnicity, and race. It had to do with character, with loyalty to God. When the woman or women of foreign nations chose to give their heart to God like Ruth and Rahab did and Zipporah did, it was perfectly fine to marry them. But when the women of the other nations remained loyal to their false gods, they were not suitable to marry. That's the principle. And it would have been true for men. Israeli women shouldn't be given to men whose hearts were going after other gods. Why? Why, why is that the, 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 why should we not marry people whose hearts are loyal to other gods? They can turn us away from God. The whole way of life is different. I mean, you know, how could you compare marrying a non-Christian with a Christian? You don't have anything in common. Can you marry somebody who is a official member of your own denomination who actually has not yet given their heart to God? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, it happens every day. 
Yeah, and have you seen that? People marrying members of their own denomination, yet they're still marrying an unbeliever. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a little trickier to see, isn't it? They may not show Especially the, if they may not show the true colors till after you're married. <laughs> and what we find is within Christian homes, and this has been documented with validated research, including Adventist homes, that there's no difference in spouse abuse rates in the Christian and Adventist homes than non-Christian and non-Adventist homes. Unbelievable. That's validated research. And that's true among the pastorate and church employees, the, the people leading the conferences. If you look across the landscape of those people in position, those people abuse their wives just as much as the non-believers in the community do. How is that even possible? Because we're not truly, truly Christians. They're not, their heart's not right with God. Yeah. I think from the- the, the fifth paragraph, pardon? From the- uh, previous scripture, those people did not worship the true God. And so I think there's, sometimes we mix up belief and worship. Actions produce feelings and, and belief. So if you will worship the true God, then your belief and your trust will grow. Actions produce feelings and character. Well, this is well said, and, and this is the law of worship. It's a design law. By beholding, we become changed, it says in Corinthians. We become like the God we admire, esteem, value, and worship. Actual worship is what you're talking about, and you can't avoid it. You worship the God of, of truth as Jesus revealed him to be. You will become more like Jesus over time. You worship an imposter God that carries the name Jesus. You'll become more like that imposter God. And so this is actually well said. They weren't actually worshiping the true God of heaven. They were worshiping some, something else. Whatever they, whatever they gave that name, whatever God, whether it's a pagan God or whether it was Yahweh with attributes that did not belong to Yahweh. Fifth paragraph says, yet despite the history of paganism and idolatry and their negative influence on the chosen nation, Jesus still brought his disciples to these places. In this way, he initiated, that, initiated them in cross-cultural urban mission, confronting their bias and bigotry, and modeled for his followers holistic urban mission in, to all cultures and nationalities. And um, why did Jesus seek out these people who were not part of Israel and took the disciples there on a mission trip? It's a very simple, straightforward answer. They accepted him. Because there's only one human race, one human race descended from Adam and Eve, and we're all born in sin, conceived in iniquity, we all suffer from the same terminal sin condition, and there's only one solution to the sin condition, and that's Jesus Christ. And every single human being on this planet, Jesus loves and wants to save. And so it was perfectly in keeping with his mission to reach out to every human being that he could reach while he was here on earth, with the gospel message and the plan of salvation. And that's what we are to be doing as well. And, and we should not be seduced into dividing society into the segments of nationality, ethnicity, racial factions, as if that has some moral or spiritual value. It doesn't. The only thing the Bible gives us authority to divide against or, or by the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goat, the righteous and the unrighteous, the saved and the lost. I mean, we, we are, and the Bible is very clear, we are not to unite with those, not to be unequally yoked. We're not to marry those of unbelievers. We are, what's it say, Paul says, that those uh, bad company corrupts good character. We are to witness to, but not bring into our circle of trust, those who are untrustworthy. Monday's lesson asks us to read Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And I can tell you that we at Come and Reason Ministries have resonated with this passage. We look around and we see so many people, both in the organized churches and outside of them, 
in need of the gospel, the eternal good news, the truth about God and his design law methods of truth, love, and freedom. And we see how limited we are in our ability and our numbers and our resources to reach so many people in the world. And we have been praying for years that God will bring more workers to the field to share with more communities. And we have seen a steady growth in the people embracing and supporting this eternal good news about God from all different denominational backgrounds. We have a large following now online that don't come from an Adventist background that love the design law truth and how these principles apply to the restoration of God's design for, for life and health and happiness because the truth about God is not restricted by denomination. It's not restricted by race or national origin or any other human division. It is only restricted. The truth about God gets gets restricted when people refuse the truth and cling to lies. That obstructs the truth. Thoughts or questions about that? Do you have any suggestions that we could do more than we're not doing to help share this with more people? Tuesday's lesson asks us to read about the story in Matthew 15, 22 to 28. It says, a Canaanite woman from the vicinity, from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was not, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me. She said, he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What do you think of this story? I think it would have been hard. Didn't Jesus care about this woman? Sure. Did he care less for her than the Jews? No. Less for her than he cared about the Jews? No. No. Well, the lesson cites a, a Bible commentary called The Desire of Ages as, a, as an explanation. This is what that commentary says. It says, Christ did not immediately reply to the woman's request. He received this representative of a despised race as the Jews would have done. In this, he designed that his disciples should be impressed with the cold and heartless manner in which the Jews would treat such a case as evinced by his reception of the woman and the compassionate manner in which he would have them deal with such distress as manifested by his subsequent granting of her petition. Do you agree with this, this interpretation? This explanation. And and you understand this is an interpretation of scripture. The scripture does not actually tell you the motives here. It just tells you the story. And so this is a very important point I teach my patients about life. There are facts and events and there are interpretations of those facts and events. We have a story about what transpired told in scripture. And then we have a Bible commentary interpreting those facts and events and putting motives to them that are not explicitly stated in the original text. This is what happens throughout all the Bible, all the Bible. Everybody is constantly reading the Bible and, and reading stories and then interpreting those stories based on their own current understanding, beliefs, presuppositions, law construct, how they view God's law works, and they're projecting or interjecting into the text all types of interpretations. This particular author has come to her conclusion and given an interpretation. Do we have confidence that this particular author is correct? Or do we think she's wrong and that, in fact, Jesus was just as prejudiced, bigoted, and biased as the rest of the Jews of his time? And he just gave in because she pestered him. That's not his character. Well, I have I have Christian patients who have, or former Christian patients who aren't Christians anymore, who have actually cited this very story to me as reasons why they don't believe because Jesus was just as bigoted and hard-hearted. He called this non-Jew a dog. He was very demeaning to her. 
very critical of her, and they use this as evidence that Jesus was not a loving Savior. What would you say to that? Why is this interpretation of the desire of ages more accurate than the interpretation of a patient who interpreted it as Jesus being harsh, cruel, bigoted, and prejudiced? Because of Jesus' response and healing. Yeah, because he healed her daughter. Yeah, but they just cite that uh, that's just the... the, the that's just Jesus' own story of the unrighteous king who the person pestered through the night finally granted what the king said. And uh, if the unrighteous king will do it, certainly your heavenly father. So Jesus is an unrighteous fake savior who just got tired of being pestered. Yes, father in heaven is, is worthy of our trust, but Jesus is just like that unrighteous king. He got pestered to death and finally did it. That's what they would say. I don't believe that, but I'm just pointing out, how do you answer that? Why is that interpretation wrong? And it is wrong because of the weight of the rest of the evidence. Because what you see and what he does in the rest of the gospel ministry and his story, how he lived his life and treated others, the woman caught in adultery, and not only how he treated her, but how he treated the, the enemies of his that were seeking to kill him, how he dealt with those abusers and liars, how he dealt with his betrayer and washed his betrayer's feet. You see a consistent pattern of self-sacrificial love, mercy, grace, and so forth. And so you can be confident that when Jesus himself is being mistreated directly, he doesn't respond like a self centered, sin-filled person that we would be tempted to do. And so you can be confident that this interpretation is actually very accurate and very reasonable because of the weight of the rest of the scripture is consistent with the character that he's manifested. The other Samaritan woman was the woman at the well. How he treated her. He gave her the... Truth. There's another good example. Yeah, and that's the point. So you, it require, So the, I guess the point I'm making is you have to have a deeper knowledge of the context, history, and the rest of the evidence, taking a slice here or a text there. And most of the people who really have a fence with, with the Bible will have their select texts that they lift up out of a story like this one story out of the life of Jesus, and they don't balance it with the entire context of what he demonstrated so they can properly interpret the motive here was love. I want to make another point about this story, though. Who were the primary in the story, in, in, the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels? Who are the primary recipients of Jesus' work, activity, concern? Who were the primary targets for Jesus' energies? His disciples that he had chosen to invest and spend three and a half years in tutorial teaching to build, train, and equip them to be able to take his gospel message to the world after he's gone. And so in this story, the woman is there, but his real target are the disciples who have biases and prejudices that he is trying to get to, to deal with. So while he loves this woman, Christ's way of dealing with the situation was a teaching moment for his disciples. But what enabled, this is what I want you to see, what enabled Christ to use this as an opportunity to teach his disciples was not merely the need of this woman's daughter, but the strength of this woman's faith. Had her faith, her trust, which is what we started talking about, been so weak, so fragile, that, had his, that his initial response would have caused her to run away in fear and shame and doubt, he could not have used that moment to give that response to teach his disciples. But her faith was strong enough that she could tolerate that momentary response and persist on to be able to have this life learning lesson for his disciples. It's quite a fascinating insight because you will see this coming up over and over again where God will use the faith of his people to reach others like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith was used to reach Nebuchadnezzar. And God longs for people to trust him enough to allow him to work through them and their real life circumstances to reach others who would not be reached without those circumstances or experiences. Well, the lesson points us to the bottom pink section, John, 1 John 2, 2. And let's read 1 John 2, 1 and 2. This is from the NIV. 
My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks with the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And there's a footnote in the NIV that says, or he is the one who turns aside God's wrath, taking away our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Instead of the atoning sacrifice, it could also, according to the NIV, read the one who turns aside God's wrath. What do you think about this Bible text in these possible translations? What's the first question? What law lens are you looking at? What law lens do you translate? And what law lens do you think this, these translators translated through? And let me be very clear here. There is a bias that is brought over in the translation that is absolutely linguistically legitimate. They are not artificially manipulating the Greek to create this interpretation. But when you translate, words have several options. For instance, the word dikaio dikaiosune can be translated just, justice, or right, righteousness. And those are absolutely legitimate options, but the translator has to decide which fits the situation better. And in the English ear, do you hear justice and righteousness with the same emphasis? No. Yeah. But it's the same Greek. And this is where a legitimate translation honest of heart can bring over a misunderstanding or mis misconstrue or connote false impressions, particularly if you're reading the text with the belief that God's law works like human law, made up rules, and justice is God enforcing his rules by punishment. Here's the good news translation of the same passage. See if it helps a little bit. I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven. And not ours only, but also the sins of everyone. This is a little softer. You'll notice who pleads with the Father. That's a little ambiguous. It could mean who pleads along with the Father. It could mean it pleads to the Father. That's, so the with gives a little ambiguity there and allows for uncertainty, which I think is actually reasonable um, to allow for people then to interpret. And then he himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven. That also doesn't tell you he's not assuaging the father's wrath. He's not paying a penalty. It's OK. What are the means? How does that come about? I think this is moving in the right direction. If we believe Jesus is pleading to the Father, then that would actually cr contradict Jesus' own words in John 16, 16, where he said that he would not pray the Father for us because the Father himself loves us. So if we believe in the principle of harmonizing Scripture, and 1 John is written by the same person who wrote the book of John, and so Jesus' testimony in the book of John is likely not to contradict what John wrote in the in 1 John, then we should really question this idea of Jesus pleading to the Father in our behalf. That should really, really throw something up at us because there's a first-level contradiction right there. Additionally, the word translated in this text in John intercessor or one who intercedes or one who pleads in our behalf it's intercedes with the father pleads an advocate with the father all of the, it's all the same greek you know what the greek word is parakletos or paraclete which is the same word translated as the holy spirit in other places the counselor the comforter that's the paraclete the one who walks along beside and helps us the advocate the one who pleads for another that's the paraclete. And this is the only place that it's attributed to someone other than the Holy Spirit. So if we accept the imposed law lie that God's law works like human law, then we believe that God is required by law to use his power to inflict just punishments for sin. And thus, the pleading must be done 
by our advocate or lawyer to the heavenly judge to make sure the proper payments have been placed in the proper record books at the proper time to erase the record of sins so the heavenly judge won't use his power to punish us. And we create this whole false human legal system. That's Satan's view and it's pagan and it's false. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. That word helper is the paraclete. But notice Jesus said he will give another, another paraclete, another helper, another comfort, another advocate, another intercessor. The Holy Spirit is the new one. The Holy Spirit is the new other. So there's already someone before the Holy Spirit who's our helper, counselor, advocate, intercessor. And who's that? Jesus. Well, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. counselor. The first counselor, advocate, paraclete, helper is Jesus himself. And Jesus is our helper, intercessor, advocate. The question is, to whom and for what? But Jesus is already working before the Holy Spirit is asked. Get your mind around this now. So, we, Jesus, so the Holy Spirit is another counselor, another comfort that's going to be added to the one we have. But Jesus is already working with another before the Holy Spirit. When he says, I will ask another in addition to you, Father, I will ask for another helper in addition to the Father and myself. Notice what Paul says in Romans 8, 31 to 34. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son but gave him up, how will he not along with him give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died? More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God. And notice this word now is also interceding for us. What's that word also mean? Along with in addition to. So Jesus is also interceding in addition to who? Who is for us? God. This is the point. God is for us. He who did not spare his son, but gave him up. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God was in the son, reconciling the world to himself. The fullness of the God had dwelt in Christ bodily. God has always been for us and has always been interceding for us and has never needed another member of the God had to intercede for him to intercede for us. In fact, Jesus is the agent of the Godhead who fulfills God's purposes, Father, I have finished the work you have given me to do, Jesus prays in John 17. He came to fulfill God's purposes, always for us. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all paracletes, all intercessors, all pleading, all seeking to help. This is the reality of the situation. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit intercede in three Places, according to scripture, three places, and not one of those places is ever one member interceding on the other member of the Godhead. The three places, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God speaks to the serpent and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her. God began interceding in the hearts and minds of fallen human beings to convict of sin, to give a desire, a longing, a, 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 a dissatisfaction with rebellion, sin, and selfishness to draw us back. He began interceding in the hearts and minds of people to draw us back to him. He also began interceding with the principalities and powers of darkness. And uh, we see this in scripture, the four angels holding back the four winds of strife, the angel armies in the book of Kings, when Elisha has uh, his servant's eyes open and we see the angel armies holding back. We see Gabriel and Daniel praise coming down, interceding with the king. God has always been interceding with the principalities and powers of darkness, holding them in check and limiting what they can do. And the third place God interceded, he interceded with the natural course of what sin does to a sinner when he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, the whole human race had a terminal death condition, a terminal sin condition that without 
intercession intervention results in eternal death. But he who knew no sin took that condition for the purpose of destroying it and opening a new pathway of eternal life. This is where the Godhead intercedes with the powers and principalities of darkness, with the fear and selfishness in our own hearts, and with the destructiveness of evil and sin providing us a new way out. It's always been that way. Yet Satan has infected the minds of people with this false law construct so that he teaches one member of the Godhead's in heaven pleading with another member of the Godhead, and that member of the Godhead is the actual source of pain, suffering, and death, that if he doesn't get a blood payment, will lash out and kill us. It's actually quite evil, that other view. Questions about that? Do you see it? And so when we read about Jesus pleading in heaven, pleading in heaven, to whom is he pleading? Us. That's exactly right. This is exactly, he said, it is expedient for you to go. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. The Comforter won't come. And when he comes, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Well, who's the Holy Spirit listening to? God and Jesus. Jesus, he is Jesus' representative on earth because Jesus is now in human form and Jesus no longer is omnipresent in all places because of his personal choice to live for the rest of eternity in his human body. And so he sends the Holy Spirit as his representative to earth to speak for him. And so Jesus is in heaven saying not to the Father, my blood, my blood, but he's saying to you and me, I have died for you. Remember the wounds in my hands. I have given my life for you. I love you. Won't you let me? I'm standing at the door of your heart knocking. If you open that door, I will come in through my Holy Spirit, and I will sup with you. I will give you a new heart my spirit. I will circumcise your heart by the Spirit. I will write my law in your hearts and minds. I will take out the old stony heart. I will put in a tender, loving heart. Won't you listen to me and let me heal, restore, and save you? He is in heaven pleading to all of us to trust him and let him save us. And this is happening before the purview of the Father because all of this is the Father's plan being worked out by his right hand, his action agent of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. And if you want some commentary on that, we don't have time to go into it because we're almost out of time today. It'll probably take us 15 minutes to go through it. But there's a long commentary in our notes today uh, that goes through this from Zechariah chapter 3, where Joshua stands the, before, and the, uh, before the angel of the Lord and Satan accuses Joshua. And the angel of the Lord rebukes Satan and removes the filthy garments and puts Joshua in perfectly righteous garments. This whole metaphor is not Jesus, the angel of the Lord, pleading to the heavenly father. It's Satan is accusing to make Joshua focus on his filthy garments. So the high priest Joshua will become insecure and fearful and turn his eyes off of Jesus, our heavenly high priest. And the whole story is keep your eyes fixed on Christ. He will remove all of your... Uh, uh, filthy garments or corruptions of character and restore you to righteousness. He will cleanse and heal you. Don't listen to the, the, the deceiver who wants you to focus on past mistakes. Listen to Jesus who has taken and given you a new heart, right spirit and cleanses you and heals you. And he says, it's not a branch plucked from the fire, the fires of sin and death that we've lived in and we've been burned by it. How many have been burned by sin, but yet we are restored to righteousness. That is the pleading that's going on, to plead to you and me not to listen to guilt, not to listen to shame, not to listen to the negative neighbor, not to listen to the old memories of the past, but to keep your eyes focused on Christ and listen to him, that he has loved you, he has engraved you on the palms of his hands, and if you trust him, he will heal you. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you send Jesus to fulfill your cause because you love the world so much that you would not let us go when Adam and Eve broke trust with you. And Jesus came and took up this broken and sick condition upon himself and destroyed it at the cross and restored your perfect righteousness into the species human. And now he stands at the head of the new human race, the new second Adam, standing at the throne of all power and, and majesty in your 
universal government directing all of the agencies for our salvation and healing. We ask that your spirit will take his victory, reproduce it in us. So it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And that we can then take this message to the world, lighten the world that you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.